Namen des Leipziger Literaturverlages herzlich willkommen hier bei unserer zweiten Buchpräsentation der Gedichte für eine neue Welt, kanadische Gegenwartslyrik, die von Susanne Opfermann und Helen Brecht Preinig im vergangenen Jahr 2020 herausgegeben worden ist. 2020 war der erste Versuch, Kanadas auf der Frankfurter Buchmesse als Gastland ähm, zeitgenössische neue kanadische Literatur zu präsentieren. Das fiel wegen Corona aus. In diesem Jahr gibt es einen ähm, Versuch. Reconnect hat die Buchmesse ihn in Frankfurt genannt, ähm, diesen Auftritt nachzuholen. Ähm, wir haben schon im Vorfeld, wie das im Verlagswesen üblich ist, ähm, also mit, ich glaube, anderthalb Jahren Vorlauf begonnen, diese Anthologie mit acht Autoren aus Kanada, acht Dichterinnen und Dichtern ganz unterschiedlicher Provenienz ähm, vorzubereiten in der deutschen Übersetzung und kennengelernt, das möchte ich noch erwähnen, haben die Übersetzer und der Verlag sich durch dieses Buch Mervyn, William Mervyn, das haben wir 2018 rausgegeben, also im Jahr davor, zwei Jahre davor. Und ähm, das ist jetzt die zweite Veröffentlichung von Susanne Opfermann und Helmbrecht Preinig im Leipziger Literaturverlag. Heute Abend freue ich mich, ähm, dass wir dank der Videokonferenzen, die im Laufe des letzten Jahres immer mehr in eine Gewohnheit übergegangen sind, dass wir auf diese Weise doch äh, Kontinente überspannt zusammenkommen können mit einer Zeitverschiebung von teilweise vier bis sechs Stunden. Also hier in Leipzig, wo wir sozusagen das Meeting gestartet haben, ist es jetzt um 19 Uhr in Kanada an manchen Orten ähm, 13, 14 oder 16 Uhr. Und ich begrüße ganz herzlich hier den kanadischen Verleger Ronald Hatch, den Sie auch hier sehen können. Ich freue mich besonders, dass er zugeschaltet ist heute Abend, trotz aller auch gesundheitlichen Hürden, die sein Auftritt hat, dass er hier teilnehmen kann. Denn letzten Endes verdanken wir diese Anthologie seiner ähm, beharrlichen Arbeit in den letzten 40 Jahren kanadische Gegenwartsautoren in seinem Verlag Ronsdale Press zu versammeln, ähm, an sie zu glauben und äh, vielfach äh, in verschiedensten Ausgaben herauszugeben. Ähm, des Weiteren begrüße ich die Dichterin ähm, Jen Arnaud, die gerade auch zugeschaltet ist. Sie ist gerade zu uns gekommen. Hello, ich winke schon mal. Ähm, den Dichter Antonio Dinado und Gary Gottfriedson. Ähm, die beiden ähm, Übersetzer, Susanne Opfermann und Helmbrecht Breinig, werden sie durch den Abend führen. Ähm, am Anfang ein paar Sätze mit äh, Ronald Hatch wechseln zum Programm der Ronsdale Press und dann werden sie die drei Dichter, die heute an unserer Buchvorstellung teilnehmen, im Einzelnen vorstellen und wir werden dann einige Gedichte gelesen in englischer Sprache und im Anschluss in der deutschen Übersetzung hören. Und im Anschluss an die Lesung wird es wie immer Gelegenheit geben für Fragen und Gespräch ähm, in deutscher oder englischer Sprache. Ähm, jetzt werden wir zwischen den Sprachen ähm, wechseln. Wir werden nicht alles ins Deutsche übersetzen. Hoffen, dass Sie auch das Eng den englischen Part folgen können. Und von den Gedichten hören Sie jeweils die Originalfassung als auch die deutsche Übersetzung. Und damit möchte ich übergeben an Susanne Opfermann und Helmbrecht Breinig. Ja, Ron? Ron, can you hear me? 
Yes, I hear you very clearly. Yeah. Could you could you just say a few words about your about Ronsdale Press, and uh, could you move the camera a bit down so that your face is visible? Okay, great, fine, fine. Okay, All right. go ahead. All right, um, here I go. Hope you can hear me. Ronsdale Press is a Canadian literary press based in Vancouver, British Columbia. We began in 1988 and we published books of poetry, of poetry, fiction, historical nonfiction about Canada, and some translations. For example, we have published English language versions of plays by Max Church. Our books regarding the history of Canada include Gold in British Columbia by Mary, Mary Elliott, who takes bridges to the gold rushes of British Columbia from 1858 to the 1870s and explaining their central importance to Canadian history. Claiming the Land by Daniel Marshall is a trailblazing history of early British Columbia. It focuses on a single year, 1858, the first year of the Fraser River Gold Rush, the third great mass migration of gold seekers in search of a new El Dorado. And then the, then the Color of Glass by David Starr, the story of the Hudson's Bay Company glass beads that the company used for trade. It's said by Captain James Cook, Canada and ended up in the possession of indigenous families who were forced to live to several conditions uh, with the beads. Our poetry books are very varied. At the moment, uh, we have Big Sky Falling by Kelsey Andrews, just, just coming out. To move from the Canadian prairies to the city of Vancouver, becomes acquainted with in her own life with depression and befriends it rather than beats it. Uh, also, just, just disappearing as pandemic poems, and this is written by Philip Resnick um, during and inspired by the initial COVID 19 outbreak in Vancouver, COVID 19 outbreak here in Vancouver, and uh, Sickwitch by Crystal Hurdle, where the poet is lured by the enigmatic Sickwitch on a metaphorical and literary vision quest through a hallucinatory train of undiagnosed medical and mental afflictions. And also coming out very soon is Out of the Dark, a cycle of poems uh, about the poem about the poet Lillian Borax Mamet, who is a child survivor of the Warsaw Ghetto. And how she has had to live with the members of the Holocaust all her life. Ron Hatch hat uh, ein bisschen die Geschichte des Ronsdale Verlages skizziert und wichtige Autoren und Autorinnen und Autoren, die von ihnen verlegt worden sind, hat vor allem auf historische Werke verwiesen äh, und auf die Gegenwartsproduktion, ein Buch über Vancouver zum Beispiel, ein Buch mit Gedichten eines deutschen Autors und anderes mehr. Ähm, Sie können all das im Internetauftritt der Ronsdale Press finden. Ähm, ich übernehme jetzt einfach das Programm. Thank you, Ron. Thanks once again for, for joining. In. Ein paar einfach führende Worte. Erstmal guten Abend in die Runde und hello, folks in, in Canada. Kanadas Erzählliteratur ist weltbekannt. Uh, Alice Munro, Margaret Atwood, Michael Ondaatje sind internationale Namen. Viel weniger bekannt ist die nicht minder gute kanadische Lyrik. Und unsere Anthologie versucht, dem ein wenig entgegenzusteuern. Ihr Titel, Gedichte für eine neue Welt, ist ein Echo auf einen Gedichtband der leider früh verstorbenen indigenen Autorin Connie Fife, deren Gedichte auch bei uns vertreten sind. Der Titel drückt Hoffnung aus und ist, hat doch auch einen ironischen Unterton, wenn er daran erinnert, dass die Europäer die beiden bereits seit Zehntausenden von Jahren besiedelten Amerikas als eine neue Welt definierten, in der sie schalten und walten konnten, wie es ihnen gefiel und nutzte. Die Frankfurter Buchmesse mit dem Schwerpunkt Kanada war ein guter Anlass, eine Auswahl aus der Lyrikproduktion der fabelhaften Ronsdale Press zu übersetzen und zweisprachig zu präsentieren. 
Und wir danken Ron Hatch und den Autorinnen und Autoren für ihre Mitarbeit und dem Canada Council for the Arts für die Finanzierung des Bandes. Der Multikulturalismus als Kern der gegenwärtigen kanadischen Selbstdefinition und damit die Probleme der individuellen wie der kollektiven Identitätsbestimmung spiegeln sich in unserem Buch, in dem neben den sich heute vorstellenden LyrikerInnen und Connie Fife auch Jan Darnen, Maria Fiamengo, Inge Israel und Pamela Porter vertreten sind, ein Spektrum von Ethnien und Herkunftsregionen. Das Land mit seiner überwältigenden Weite, die zum Teil noch immer wilde, aber auch bedrohte kanadische Natur, sind immer wieder Gegenstand der Gedichte, die auch formal eine große Bandbreite aufweisen und manchmal Elemente aus den Herkunftssprachen verwenden, so wie bei äh, Gary Gottfriedson äh, später in unserer Lesung. Wir freuen uns auf die Lesungen im Original und bitten Sie, wie äh, Viktor Kalinka bereits gesagt hat, mögliche Fragen bis an das Ende der Lesung aufzubewahren. Und wenn wir Zeit haben, werden wir eine kleine Gesprächsrunde anschließen. Wir beginnen mit Joanne Arnold. Joanne, I will briefly say two or three sentences to introduce you and then uh, the floor is yours, okay? Uh, hi, I'm Suzanne. <laughs> um, Joanne Arnott wurde in Winnipeg geboren und lebt in British Columbia. Uh, sie ist uh, Métis, das heißt eine Angehörige der als eingeborene Ethnie anerkannten Nachfahren von indigenen und europäischen, vor allem französischen Siedlern und Pelzjägern. Sie hat bisher acht Gedichtbände veröffentlicht und äh, Essaybände und ihre Gedichte, die wir heute Abend lesen, stammen aus ihrem Buch A Night for the Lady. Okay, Joanne, can you take over now? Thank you very much for the invitation to read and for, for translating my work. Poems, poems, poems. I used to live across the street from a strip joint. My eldest son and his friend mortified me to no end. After we'd stepped over the needles and condoms all the way to kindergarten and or the corner store, we would pause for the light to cross the street and the pulsing music would cause these five-year-old boys to dance, dance with elation. How can I hold a sour look given the hilarity I am feeling. Now my son is 21, moving out this weekend with his king-size bed. I am building a poetry joint across the way. Poems, poems, poems on display. Thank you. Gedichte, Gedichte, Gedichte. Was? Nicht anschauen. Das macht er nicht. Ich wohnte früher gegenüber von einem Striptease-Lokal. Mein ältester Sohn und sein Freund brachten mich ewig in Verlegenheit, wenn wir über die ganzen Nadeln und Kondome gestiegen waren, auf dem Weg zum Kindergarten und oder dem Laden an der Ecke, warteten wir auf die Ampel, um über die Straße zu gehen. Und die wummernde Musik brachte diese zwei Fünfjährigen immer zum Tanzen zum Tanzen, mit Begeisterung. Wie kann ich da sauer schauen bei der Fröhlichkeit, die ich spüre? Jetzt ist mein Sohn 21, zieht dieses Wochenende aus mit seinem King-Size-Bett. Ich baue ein Lyriklokal auf der anderen Straßenseite. Gedichte, Gedichte, Gedichte in der Auslage. Warum kriege ich das jetzt nicht? Constance. When I was pregnant, she told me, reaching back more than 20 years for the memory, I put sunflower seeds on my belly. I used to read aloud to my son so he could hear our bones. I love our voices, she said. Some gifts are true, arising, uprising from the core of human being. These outweigh the lesser gifts. Chickadee and sparrow flutter down lured by the seeds and undisturbed by our voices. I put your hand on my belly. I invite you to read this aloud. I want to listen to our bones, 
and to love our voices for a little while. Konstanz, mit Dank an Conny Ford. Als ich schwanger war, erzählte sie mir eine Erinnerung von mehr als 20 Jahren. Ich legte Sonnenblumenkerne auf meinen Bauch. Ich las meinem Sohn immer laut vor, sodass er unseren Knochen lauschen konnte. Ich liebe unsere Stimmen, sagte sie laut. Manche Gaben sind aufrichtig, steigen auf aus dem Kern des Menschseins. Sie wiegen schwerer als leichtere Gaben. Meisen und Spatzen flatterten herab, angelockt von den Körnern und nicht gestört von unseren Stimmen. Ich lege deine Hand auf meinen Bauch. Ich lade dich ein, dies laut vorzulesen. Ich möchte deinen Knochen lauschen und unsere Stimmen lieben ein Weilchen. A bloody man imposes his redness on dinner forgotten poem. A bloody man imposes his redness on dinner, beginning in the morning, hunted and proceeded to slaughter, but forgetting to ask permission first, to lead the offerings, to give thanks. Home again after, careful to wash lifeblood from arms and hands and boots, missing the spray across his right ear entirely, proceeding to table, but forgetting still to ask permission first, to leave offerings to give thanks. Child eyes down behind lowered lids, lids thin as leaves in the forest sheltering birds, scent of blood and soap and dinner intermingling, flushed cheeks all around, mouths slowly chewing silence. Ein blutbefleckter Mann nötigt dem Abendessen seine Röte auf. Vergessenes Gedicht mit Dank an seinen Kaufmann. Ein blutbefleckter Mann nötigt dem Abendessen seine Röte auf. Er ging morgens los, jagte und ging dann über zum Schlachten, aber vergaß zuerst um Erlaubnis zu bitten, Opfer zu bringen, Dank zu sagen. Danach wieder zu Hause wusch er sorgfältig Lebensblut von Armen und Händen und Stiefeln, vergaß völlig den Spritzer über sein rechtes Ohr, ging zu Tisch, aber vergaß immer noch zuerst um Erlaubnis zu bitten, Opfer zu bringen, Dank zu sagen. Kinderaugen gesenkt hinter gesenkten Liedern, Lieder so dünn wie Blätter im Wald, die Vögel verstecken. Geruch von Blut und Seife und Abendessen vermischt sich. Gerötete Wangen allenthalben, Münder kauen langsam das Schweigen. World Shapers Creation stories are lullabies for grown-ups. They remind us of all the possible ways and means that worlds can be born and humans come to be. Tricksters and goddesses, fire and water, the one God or all of the gods working as a team. World makers, world shakers, world breakers. There is no end to the doing and the undoing of our creators. They have imagined us over and over and over, recreating us and recreating our world on a whim. There is no end to us humans either. We keep reinventing the cosmos and fighting one another's visions with killing hands. We have our feast times and our fast times, our celebrations and our long days and nights of lament. Yet we are not powerless. We reinvent, we shape and reshape the world every single day. Weltenformer. Schöpfungsgeschichten sind Schlaflieder für Erwachsene. Sie erinnern uns daran, auf wie viele Arten und Weisen Welten geboren werden und Menschen entstehen können. Trickster und Göttinnen, Feuer und Wasser, der eine Gott oder alle Götter, die als Team zusammenarbeiten. Weltenmacher, Weltenschüttler, Weltenbrecher. Das Schaffen und Zerstören unserer Schöpfer hat kein Ende. Sie haben sich uns ausgedacht, wieder und wieder und wieder. 
uns neu geschaffen und unsere Welt neu geschaffen aus einer Laune heraus. Auch wir Menschen haben kein Ende. Wir erfinden den Kosmos immer wieder neu und bekämpfen die Visionen der anderen mit Händen, die töten. Wir haben unsere Festzeiten und unsere Fastenzeiten, unsere Feiern und unsere langen Tage und Nächte der Klage. Doch sind wir nicht machtlos. Wir erfinden die Welt neu. Wir formen und formen sie neu. Jeden einzelnen Tag. Das war's. Vielen Dank, Joanne. Vielen Dank. Joanne. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you very much. Uh, unser nächster Autor, Gary Gottfriedson. Er gehört zur indigenen Nation der Sequepang. Er ist Dichter, Lehrer und Rancher aus British Columbia und wuchs in einer bekannten Ranching- und Rodeo-Familie auf. Zugleich ist er tief verwurzelt in der Spiritualität und den Traditionen seines Volkes. Bisher hat er zehn Gedichtbände und ein Kinderbuch publiziert. Gottfried Sons hier vorgetragene Gedichte sind seinen Bänden Clinging to Bone und Death Heaven entnommen. Okay. So I'm Gary Godfordson, and I'm from the Sohopan Nation here in Kamloops. And I would like to thank you guys for, for having the privilege of being in this book. So the first I'm going to read is called This Holy Place. I was born with songs surging from my throat, swirling in the blood of my life givers, tossing in the currents of trickster stories of my Sohuapan ancestors. Still fresh in my mind is their last living image standing on the shores of Sedetqua, the river, where my grandchildren now stand, humming songs to pull salmon from the water to sky, tumbling in the waves at the banks and riverbeds of time. My long gone relatives rattle and drum small holy songs atop the rippling rivers waves that lead to the lakes and headwaters, where the salmon and Saskatoons offer their spirits to us. We call this land Sohopn Uluh, so powerful, so strong. They bend the ears of kindred spirits, filling hearts, our hearts, with courage to speak for this land, for this water, for our future for this holy place. Thank you. Dieser heilige Ort. Ich wurde mit Liedern geboren, die aus meiner Kehle stiegen, im Blut meiner Lebensspender kreisten, in den Strömen der Trickster-Geschichten meiner Sequepang armen wirbelten. Doch frisch in meiner Erinnerung ist ihre letzte lebende Erscheinung, wie sie an den Ufern der Sequepang stammten, des Flusses, an dem nun meine Enkel stehen, Liedersummen, um Lachse aus dem Wasser in den Himmel zu ziehen, herumtollen in den Wellen an den Ufern und in Flussbetten der Zeit. Meine lang verschwundenen Verwandten spielen mit Rassel und Trommeln kurze, heilige Lieder über den Wellen des sich kreuzenden Flusses, die zu den Seen und dem Quellgebiet führen, wo Salmon und Saskatoons uns ihre Geister offenbaren. Wir nennen dieses Land Sequepagulk. So mächtig, so stark, sie neigen das Ohr verwandter Geister, füllen die Herzen, unsere Herzen, mit dem Mut, das Wort zu ergreifen, für dieses Land, für dieses Wasser, für unsere Zukunft, für diesen heiligen Ort. Ich will dich nicht zu weit zurück lesen, du bist sonst zu weit weg von The land skin. The frost thickens by night, seeping into the earth by day. The land's skin makes ready an armor for winter. Heavy fog shields the sun by morning, lifts leaves to age by midday. Transformation is difficult, 
but the skin sheds death. Die Haut des Landes. Der Raureif wird dicker über Nacht, sickert tags in die Erde. Die Haut des Landes bereitet sich eine Rüstung für den Winter. Dichter Nebel schirmt morgens die Sonne, hebt Blätter, die bis zum Mittag altern. Verwandlung ist schwierig, aber die Haut schuppt den Tod. And just like that, and just like that, it all comes out beyond just a story, truth, deep down inside. The residential schools, their stories from survivors, the sun sees it all surfacing, murdered and missing women now driven by blood red songs. Reconciliation, so they call it, is not black and white words, skinning thin layers off the tongue. Reconciliation is admitting prey was at stake. Lives gunned down in the name of the church and crown. And just like that, it all comes out. Und einfach so. Und einfach so kommt alles heraus. Mehr als nur eine Geschichte. Die Wahrheit tief im Inneren der Internate, die Geschichten ihrer Überlebenden. Die Sonne sieht alles zum Vorschein kommen. Ermordete und vermisste Frauen, jetzt von blutroten Liedern getrieben. Versöhnung, wie sie es nennen, heißt nicht schwarze und weiße Wörter, die dünne Schichten von der Zunge häuten. Versöhnung heißt zuzugeben, dass es um Beute ging im Namen von Kirche und Krone zusammengeschossene Leben. Und einfach so kommt alles heraus. Clear memory. The years whip gray into the hair, oh so subtly. We have lived through many storms, dreamed many nights away. Time softened our hearts, brushed clear memory out on the yellow canvas of sky. Another night meant bones rested. Another day meant life renewed. Another year meant new stories. Some things are meant to be forgotten, but I remember all of you. Klar Erinnerung. Die Jahre treiben grau ins Haar, ach, so sagt. Wir haben viele Stürme durchlebt, viele Nächte weggeträumt. Die Zeit machte unsere Herzen weich, kehrte Erinnerung frei, draußen auf der gelben Leinwand des Himmels. Eine weitere Nacht hieß Ruhe für die Glieder. Ein weiterer Tag hieß neues Leben. Ein weiteres Jahr hieß neue Geschichten. Manche Dinge sollte man vergessen. Aber dich erinnere ich ganz und gar. Guns and words. These shadow words, blackness between the spaces of teeth, bold and raw barnacles sticking to gums that make the Canadian stutter. Since truth is hidden behind lips and across this mosaic land, a crop of lies, Canada's bequest to the world. And I have given my life. I am the mixed blood of contempt, the reminder of the white man's survival in the fur trade, the curse of my original ancestors. Yet my mother's people put me on a mountain so that my own salvation would drip from the sweat and tears I offered as prayer to build a future for my Sohwapen grandchildren. No vision was offered, but the words of my ancestors streamed from my mouth, using the weapon of the white man to speak the sounds of my blood into an English speaking world, because what is believed is the ink that splatters on paper. 
even though I am nothing and I have nothing, only volcanic poetry, will you still point a gun at me? Waffen und Wörter. Diese Schattenwörter, schwarzes in den Zahnzwischenräumen, freche, rohe Muscheln, die am Zahnfleisch kleben und den Kanadier stottern lassen. Denn Wahrheit ist hinter den Lippen verborgen und über dem Mosaik dieses Landes eine Ernte von Lügen, Kanadas Vermächtnis an die Welt. Und ich habe mein Leben gegeben, ich bin der Mischling aus Verachtung, die Erinnerung an das Überleben des weißen Mannes beim Pelzhandel, der Fluch meiner ursprünglichen Ahnen. Doch die Familie meiner Mutter brachte mich auf einen Berg, damit meine eigene Rettung aus Schweiß und Tränen sickern würde, die ich darbot als Gebet, um eine Zukunft zu bauen für meine Sequepenk-Enkel. Keine Vision bot sich da, aber die Worte meiner Ahnen strömten aus meinem Mund, um mit der Waffe des weißen Mannes den Klang meines Blutes zu sprechen, hinein in eine englischsprachige Welt, denn geglaubt wird nur die Tinte, die sich auf Papier ergießt. Obwohl ich nichts bin und nichts habe, außer vulkanischen Gedichten, Richtest du noch immer dein Gewehr auf mich? Thank you very much, Harry. Unser nächster Dichter ist Anthony Dinardo. Er wurde in Montreal, Montreal geboren und begann seine Karriere als Journalist. Seine neueren Gedichte wurden ins Italienische und Französische übersetzt und mehrfach ausgezeichnet. Er lebt in Sutton, Quebec und Coburg, Ontario. Seine Sammlung Skylight aus sehr die hier vorgetragenen Gedichte stammen, behandelt die Interaktion zwischen einer gefährdeten natürlichen Welt und dem menschlichen Beobachter. Anthony? Thank you. Guten Abend und vielen Dank to all our wonderful translators, our publishers and those who read poetry. It's, it's wonderful to be here among you. Um, The poems that I'll be reading will be from this book published by Ronsdale, Skylight. And uh, it's a collection, as you will see, that explores the interplay between the natural world and of course me, the observer, a relationship that I think is characterized by both beauty and, and terror. Um, I am by nature a poet, but I'm also very much a nature poet, as you will find out when I embrace bird life, garden life, and the light of the imagination in the poems I will read. The first one is called The Lark, Alouette in French, uh, a bird that loves to preen itself. But in this poem, I have the bird hang out with the Borgias during the Italian Renaissance, The Lark. His eminence, the lark, is fond of bonbons, finds them among dead leaves, woodland raws, swollen bowers. There's purpose to his hips, swung in praise of articulation, the state of the bosom, flight from the nest. There's purpose to landing, heaving to suckle roots, naked as a borgia, the rock face of a slope with its nose in the air, sniffing the air, the pungent tart of hemlock. The lark lives in its renaissance, a quick study of soft feathers, velvet, silks, brocades in the arms of the conifers, an ancient family that rules. Its shelters and stores add concupiscence to any garden or woodland flare, to any poem that allows the lark to wander in and out unannounced. The Ohrenlerche. Ihre Eminenz, die Lerche, mag Bonbons, findet sie unter toten Blättern, Waldsenken gefüllten Schattengründen. Zielgerichtet die Hüften, die sie zum Lobpreis der Beweglichkeit schwingt, die aufrechte Brust, der Flug vom Nest. Zielgerichtet die Landung, heben und senken, um von Wurzeln zu nippen, nackt wie eine Borgia, das Gesicht einer Felswand, 
ihre Nase in der Luft, die Luft witternd, die stechende Schärfe der Hemlock-Tanne. Die Lerche lebt in ihrer Renaissance, eine rasche Skizze weicher Federn samt Seide, Brokat in den Armen der Koniferen, einer alten Herrscherfamilie. Ihre Zufluchtsstellen und Vorratslager bringen Sinnlichkeit in jeden Garten, Waldesleuchten in jedes Gedicht, das der Lerche erlaubt, hinein und hinaus zu wandeln, unangemeldet. It was the English poet Auden who said, poetry makes nothing happen. So in this poem, it does make something happen. It makes the sunrise and the moon stay put. It's called, I write and write. I write and write and nothing happens. It's only rain washing away in the pond. Earlier, the thumbnail of a moon would not trade places with the trees I held in my hands. The sun was beginning to rise, but the moon stayed put. Caught, I could tell, in the branches I kept. Sprouting. Ich schreibe und schreibe. Ich schreibe und schreibe und nichts passiert. Es ist nur Regen, der im Teich zerfließt. Vorher wollte der Daumennagel von Mond seinen Platz nicht mit den Bäumen tauschen, die ich in Händen hielt. Die Sonne fing an aufzugehen, aber der Mond blieb an seinem Ort. Gefangen, so war mir klar, in den Zweigen, die ich sprießen ließ. The next poem is called Portrait of a Grouse. A grouse is a kind of partridge that is in this area where I live, and it's often called a fool hen. A fool hen because of the way it stops dead in its track, the way it kind of freezes whenever it's alerted to danger. One just happened to fly through the screen and into a room of my house and had to be helped to get it back out into the woods. Uh, but that day it inspired a whole suite of poems for me. Uh, one of them is this one, Portrait of a Grouse. How to pick a drop of pink without a brush, stitch an open wound with just a beak. She makes house calls, tears down walls. She's blinded, she's broken winded. She's in the room, thrumming through. She's footloose, flight lost, answers to full hen. A dust of dawn on feathers, autumn on her palate. She's half the sun, the other half moonlight, bristling on her gown. She's totally Norval Moriso about sighs and sorrow. She's fingers trembling, fat thighs on the couch. Leaves blend, browns patch. She goes without, comes within. Paints a portrait of herself entirely without wings. So we're not reading the translation of this one. So you can- No, you are not. You know you are not. Um, I really keep an ear to the ground. I'm, I'm enamored with the gardens that surround me. And, uh, and I sometimes hear flowers actually sing to me. This one sang to me, it's called Woodland Violet. What woodland violet would want more than woodland rain and rain, sun? Yes, what we need, but no more, no more than this. Waldfeilchen. Welches Waldfeilchen wollte mehr als Waldland, Regen und Regen, Sonne, ja, was wir brauchen, aber nicht mehr, nicht mehr als das. This poem Lace is really a reference to Queen Anne's Lace, also a flower that sang to me. Lace. You're the world of the rest of mine, the spin and furl of fingers curled into the arms of a chair, the eye of a pistol, the lips of a stamen, fractal of Queen Anne's lace, a shade less than tranquil, a tad more than equal to the sum of its physics. You're like the house on a snail, 
that spirals and seizes the trail she leaves behind, the snail bedazzled by the math on her back. The next poem I'll read is called The Craft So Long to Learn, which I'm sure many of you will recognize as a line from, uh, from Chaucer. Uh, there's a bit of an epigraph to this poem called, uh, which, which is to see the forest for the trees. The craft so long to learn. Poetry comes and goes like a doe and her fawn, might show up only briefly on the edge of the words, then leave you doubting what it was you've written the first flowers of spring, or was that the river going by? I'm a nature poet and it's in my nature to commune with the dead, to talk to the quick. I'm a record of the words I'm in, of the flocks and goldenrod, occasional flights of blue skies and clarity, of words for rain and words for wet with not a chance of a narrative to interfere with the forecast. There are days when the muse appears unannounced like the sudden flash of a white-tailed deer, like a leap of faith to the other side of the riverbank. I remember once foraging the woods for an image and I forgot the word for syrup. So I sipped on the sap that dripped, dripped from the tip of my pen and I started to write. Die Kunst so lang zu erlernen, ein Titelzeiler von Jeffrey Chaucer. Sie begraft den Wald vor lauter Bäumen sehen. Dichtung kommt und geht wie eine Hirschkuh und ihr Kälbchen nur kurz am Saum der Wörter auftauchen, um dich dann fragen zu lassen, was es war, das du geschrieben hast. Die ersten Blumen des Frühlings oder war es der Fluss, der vorüberfloss? Ich bin Naturdichter und es liegt in meiner Natur, mit den Toten ins Gespräch zu sein die Lebenden anzusprechen. Ich bin das Archiv von Wörtern, in denen ich stecke, von Flops und Goldrute, gelegentlichen Schwärmen von blauen Himmeln und Klarheit, von Wörtern für Regen und Wörtern für Nass, ohne jede Chance, eine Geschichte, den Wetterbericht unterbrechen zu lassen. Es gibt Tage, an denen die Muse auftaucht, unangemeldet, wie die plötzliche Erscheinung eines Weißwedelhirsches, wie ein Glaubenssprung, zur anderen Seite des Flussufers. Einmal durchstöberte ich den Wald auf der Suche nach einem Bild und hatte das Wort für Sirup vergessen und nippte daher an dem Saft, der heruntertropfte, tropfte von der Spitze meines Stifts und ich begann zu schreiben. You know, I think it actually sounds better in German. <laughs> I love, I love the way that that concludes. I, I, I love all that spitting that happens, you know, with those consonants. Wonderful. Thank you, Helen. Thank you for that. Um, this next poem is called White Vale, Ontario. It's, it's the name of the village uh, where I lived on the outskirts of Toronto for many years. And in this poem, I, I address the timelessness and precious quality of village life in a place that is sensitive to the natural world. Good place for a nature poet to live. Whitevale, Ontario. The epigram is, parting is the song of the sweet, sweet sparrow. The sound of peepers, frogs at the mouth of the marsh, red wings at roost, the light conferring mind of a naturalist at each door, the linden and the walnut glistening, the rains gone, voices piping, green molecules rising in the air. The sun's never too old for this. Tenderly it touches you and should you resist, the garden's backyard bird calls ample and exhaustive answer for you. If you sit or stand or step on any porch in town and listen, some story will come to you. Some playground of open sky and airships groaning distant mowers, funerals and hollowed eyes, Sunday strings boxed in icons of stained glass, book sales by dawn, chamomile and festivals that peak in spring. And those are just some of the things that will come to you and keep you from ever leaving again. The, the, this poem, the, the next poem I'll read, Le Nourage and, and the following one, uh, um, I, I wrote them while living in, in Vence in the south of France one winter. 
And uh, I, I spent a lot of time looking at the sky, observing the sky. And many of the poems come from that experience. And uh, I just happened to give each and every one of those poems a French title, Le Nuage. The figure reclining in the cloud that I snapped with my phone today looked like it was by Georgia O'Keeffe, painted during an early period when she often turned to the sky to see what time it was. The image, a copy of her white pansy from 1927, stark yet softly petaled, about which a poet might say that it's a photo of the dead where the many layered soul has left the body and floated up into the heavens, whereupon she sees it today as a larger than life reproduction, slowly moving north, northwest, and occupying but a corner of the vast blue, blue canvas, which wherever she looks appears empty and blank as if it has yet to absorb another soul or reveal what time of day it is. In the last poem, Chanson. I resisted the wild winds of winter for as long as I could. All afternoon, they came at me like fists over the mountain. I couldn't write a word. I lost the first round, beaten into a corner, silenced by the beating I took. But when the sun went down, I willed the wind to leave and I turned my back to it. The terrible wind defeated at last. Darkness fell. My victory so fired up the cells of my being, I could see well enough to turn on the overhead light and sing the praises of passive resistance. Chanson. Ich widerstand den wilden Winterwinden, solange ich konnte. Den ganzen Nachmittag gingen sie mich an wie Fäuste über den Berg. Kein Wort konnte ich schreiben. Ich verlor die erste Runde, in eine Ecke geprügelt, sprachlos gemacht durch die Schläge, die ich einsteckte. Aber als die Sonne unterging, brachte mein Wille den Wind zum Abdrehen und ich wandte ihm meinen Rücken zu, dem schrecklichen, endlich besiegten Wind. Dunkelheit senkte sich. Mein Sieg befeuerte derart die Zellen meines Wesens, dass ich gut genug sehen konnte, um das Außenlicht anzumachen und ein Loblied zu singen auf den passiven Widerstand. Ja, yeah. thank you, thank you, Anthony, thank all of you uh, for giving us the gift of your poetry and of your reading. And uh, yeah, thanks all. The, thanks to all the contributors. And uh, now is the moment. Jetzt wäre der Augenblick, wo wir vielleicht noch ein bisschen sprechen können, Fragen stellen auf Englisch oder Deutsch an wen auch immer, Verleger, Autor*innen, notfalls auch Übersetzer*innen. Und uh, ja, jetzt is the audience but Anthony. I have a question for you as translators. How, how did you decide which poems you were to translate? How did you land upon the ones you, 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 you finally chose? What were the criteria? My, our criteria were a certain diversity, um, certain things we, as Germans associated with Canada, like in your case, nature, John Donnan would be another uh, case in point. Um, the identity question, multiculturalism and so forth. So there was a thematic focus. There was also a formal focus. We try to have different kinds of poetry represented different voices, different sounds, um, which was particularly interesting in the case of um, those poems, like, uh, like Gary especially, where native words are used and introduced, which brings in something like a challenge 
uh, an intellectual challenge and an intercultural challenge. So, uh, yeah, but that's just about all I can say. It's, it's just we we chose the poems we liked, yeah. and uh, poems that represented a certain range of of aspects which I've just uh, enumerated. Also, the question ging uh, um den uh, was brachte uns dazu bestimmte Dich Gedichte auszuwählen. Und ich habe gesagt, es war eine Vielfalt, die wir repräsentiert haben wollten, als Deutsche, die nach Kanada blicken. Ähm, die Natur äh, repräsentiert in diesem Fall Naturdichtung äh, durch Ernst Dinado. Andere Aspekte, den Multikulturalismus, Dinge, die ich bereits in meiner Einführung vorhin erwähnt habe. Und auch gleichzeitig eine Vielfalt der formalen Aspekte, der Vielfalt der Stimmen, der Klänge, ähm, bis hin eben zu den äh, indigenen äh, Vokabeln zumindest, man Sprachfragmenten, die auftauchen, äh, zum Beispiel in der, in der Dichtung von Gary Gottfriedson. Und uh, um, let me just add to this that it was uh, a, a very difficult process of choosing because there was so much. We, we read a lot and, you know, it, it, was, it was a tough decision and we wanted to have an, everybody should have an equal share. So, um, okay, also es war keine einfache Auswahl. Wir haben sehr viel gelesen und viel diskutiert und uns letztlich dann für das entschieden, wofür wir uns entschieden haben. Aber And we like a lot of poetry. <laughs> <laughs> no, obviously. <laughs> uh, I think it's a wonderful collection. I, I've been enjoying and I continue to enjoy many of the poems that. Uh, sure, I, not so much a question as just a thank you for those readings. They're beautiful and they're really great gifts. Um, I'm going to give a gift back if I can, and that is to ask Gary G and Joanne Arnott. If I can use your poems in a class I'm teaching in poetry, do I have your permission? Thank you. And yeah, absolutely. That would be an honor for me. Thank you. And secondly, uh, Anthony, uh, I'm, I was reading a, one of yours again, the food court in the book. Yeah. And I like that one very much. It reminded me of Allen Ginsberg's poem on a supermarket. Have, do you know about that poem? I do. I yeah. do, but it had, had no bearing on that one, was not influenced by it. Ginsburg has influenced a lot of my work. I'm kind of yeah. attracted to the beats and the serialist as well, for that matter. Uh, but I can see how you would make that connection between supermarket and food court. Yeah. One of, one of the things it does, of course, is take up the battle, you know, and it, and it gives a good right blow to the fakery of our lives. Oh, can you, yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It's a shorter poem. Can you read it? I don't know if I'm allowed to do this and break the rules, but could you read that poem? I, I'd, <laughs> love, to, I'd love to read it. <laughs> I, I, I chose not to read it because of its length and I wanted to keep within the, the 10 minutes, but uh, yeah. Uh, food court. The bees are faked. A virtual buzz instills the air with an air of virtuosity. It doesn't get more real. It doesn't get more real than this. The flora's just as duped. Shades of neon downtown pink. Sprays of manufactured lady slippers, lupins, hair perfume. The din of pink. Glaze to wash away the gritty bits that stick. The birds are faked. The ferns are fake. And other words for song. Here, where the animal in the belly learns to growl, where the benches are eco-friendly, recycled imitation polymers, neo-outdoor revivalist by decree. Here, where players known as patrons sit, where words imitate each other. The trees and harmony harmonize with artificial casts of lighting filtered through scrubbed acrylic planes of faux transparency in long unbreakable chains of molecules indoors, climate controlled, with non-reactive plastic claws, knives and forks, prosthetic limbs poised on mannequins dressed in subterranean gear, where headlines on the screens materialized, unrealized, neutralized to emulate a woodlot in a concrete meadow, where I'm in line for bottled water, where the creek 
is dead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Bring in the indoor, bring in the outdoors in. And this is what happens when you plasticize nature in a food court, right? Yeah, really. I'm so fed oh, up with that. Oh, they're horrible places, aren't they? <laughs> Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay. Um, I would like to ask uh, Joanne a question. Joanne. Um, Joanne and Gary should have the chance to read additional poems of their choice also. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so, uh, since Anthony just did it, you are free to do, do so too. If you want to? Well, I think, why don't you ask Joanne her question, your question first? Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, Joanne, what does your poetry mean to you? Is, is this a, um, in your poems often are, um, to me, they, they have a strong political impact. You know, speaking of um, hard lives or uh, violence, um, gender relations in, in ways that are uh, really gripping. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? I think I use poetry to balance my life so that um, as life is coming in, then it creates a, a tension that I then resolve through writing. And so often it is the, you know, the less restful aspects of life that catch my attention and come out in poetry. That makes sense. Okay. Would you want to read another of your poems? Sure, I will do that. Uh, it's called Gift Bearing a Gift. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I reference a Canadian poet, John Newlove. Thinking about John Newlove, his alcoholic dad, his own child alcoholism, his leaving the prairie and living on welfare in Vancouver, his eventual fame, his eventual sobriety, the way he was remembered by his friends, by his fans, for his poetic hands steady on the wheel of his works, while all else is disarray. Depression and that thin line of hope along the horizon, eyes damp with life's possibilities, while the siren calls from within, all devastation embedded and encountered, luring the gaze inward. You can survive this, it's true. Decisions have to be made a body used to carve a mark of self-pity on an alley wall for a taming of the sirens and a few years left for balance. <laughs> attention, on the eye, attention on the eye and thou, a final assessment of the reality you are, a gift bearing a gift bearing fruit, fruit so wild and sweet, poems so succulent, we are disarmed, eye damp beauty. Now it's time. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> you, want? you know, I studied under Allen Ginsberg for two years. Wow. Yeah, wow. I did. I, so wow. for two years, I studied under him. And um, a lot of my earlier work was very, very politically charged. And it still is kind of, but um, yeah. he, he was amazed at how I could sit there and meditate um, for long periods of time. And he would ask me, how can you do that? Because everybody else was fidgeting around. Because at that time he was into Buddhism and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I said, it's part of my cultural background. If I can sit on a mountain for four days and pray, sitting in a class for one hour and meditating was nothing. So. <laughs> Okay, I'll read a really short poem, um, and it's called Foreigner. I've been a foreigner in many places in this world, misplaced in the minds of others. My skin is the scent of Sokopmuch Uluh, a res Indian, a foreigner in my homeland. Can you imagine that? Yeah. Foreigner in your homeland. Yeah. That's yeah. Strong. In, in Canada here, we have reservations. <laughs> and, you know, if you know the history of Canada, <clears throat> we were rounded up and put on reservations to be 
starved, to be um, have our children taken away, put in residential schools. We have a very dark history in Canada. And um, so to this very day in um, October 21st, 2021, I am still considered a foreigner in my own land. I am not equal to other citizens in Canada. And I still live on a reservation. Mm. And um, so, and like, and like Joanne, we both come from, when you're born Métis or of indigenous ancestry here, you are born into a political climate without choice. Other Canadians have wonderful choices that they can make, but because I have a, a number in Canada, 688-0033701, I am uh, a legal ward of the Canadian government from the day I'm born till the day I die. Yeah, thank you. That's a very impressive statement. Ähm, ich weiß nicht, muss ich das übersetzen? Nee, gut. Uh, Gary, I have a question to, to this topic. Um, yes. Maybe these are two questions. Uh, the first is, um, what is your relationship to the English language? I suppose it is also a strange language to you, to your native languages. And how it is possible to, to write poetry in English for you? How it is possible? Because I, I know from, from all the other the translation of poetry, it's nearly un, impossible to translate poetry from one language to another language. And maybe it's something new in the other language. A new, and and you, I I suppose maybe trend it's, it's it's similar. You translate inside of your soul from your native languages into English. But but how how's your relationship to this strange English language we all use now all over the world for communicating? Well, I mean, I grew up bilingual, mm -hmm. right? Um, And I don't know if you know it or not, but up until 1982, um, our languages and our indigenous languages in Canada, it was illegal for us to speak it until 1982. Um, but I grew up speaking my language, but I grew up also with English. So I can think easily in either language. And I can speak easily in either language as well, too. Um, as far as English goes, English is a very fun language to write poetry from. But as is my language, my language already is naturally poetic because one word can describe a whole poem in itself. But the challenge is, is like taking the translation from one word in my language into a poetic form in the English language. So it's a bit of a challenge sometimes, but it's a, it's a lot of fun because you can play with a lot of words in English. And, um, but there are times where there are some words where it is, explicit to my language and it cannot be translated into English because of the limitation of the English language itself. Cool. So I hope that answers your question. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. And the and second aspect I want to ask for, it's the relationship between poetry and truth for you because Your, your poems are very political. And um, as I remember from, um, especially for instance, the East German poetry, the poets could tell the, the listeners and the readers more than the newspapers. 
before revolution. Yes. And and poetry had more truth than journalistic research and than science. Science was a lie. Yeah. yeah. The, the, the social yeah. science. And what is for you the 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 relationship between poetry and truth in your situation? I I remember in this year I heard first time of the abuse of the um, um, of the indigenous children in the residential homes in, in Northern America. It was I, I heard in in the media for the first time after 30 years after, yeah. and there's some some um, process started in in, in, the, in the public now, but. I think your your poems are written much earlier, and and um, what 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 it's uh, it's yeah your your well the relationship between truth and poetry. Ginsburg says that first thought, best thought. It's the purest thought. Now in poetry, you can you can use the devices in poetry to create the truth and to create observation. Whereas in journalism, you're restricted because you have, you're, you're restricted to a certain audience and you're restricted to, to what the government of the day wants you to know. Whereas in poetry, you can, you can talk about the hidden parts of history and All of my books, uh, as uh, you know, uh, Ron Ron Hatch took a big risk mm -hmm. in publishing a lot of my poetry because it's very politically charged, mm -hmm. um, and so Canadians do not want to hear about the dirty black history of Canada, residential schools, reservations, um, the division, of, and you know the. Of, of how the Métis people are treated. And Joanne could speak more to that because you know Joanne is Métis as well. Um, Canadians do not want to hear about Canada's dirty history. They want Canada to believe that Canada is a very loving, open-minded country, and it is, but nobody wants to look at dirty laundry. And Canada is full of dirty laundry. Just recently in, in June, there are 215 unmarked bodies found in my reserve due to the residential school, which is now turned into a crime scene in Canada. And it's shaken this whole country up. And it's created um, um, a, um, a war within the consciousness of people across this country. Many Canadians are in denial and making up excuses about it, but others are beginning to research more. And I think the poet's job is to tell the truth. I think that's our job as poets to tell the truth. If we don't tell the truth, then we might as well be, you know, a country of liars, a citizen, you know, of, of liars, right? So it's the poet's job to observe. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about Howell, for example, Ginsburg's Howell. I mean, he tackled the American corporations and, you know, and, and that big regime of the American psyche and, and you know, and I think um, as poets, it's our job to tell the truth. It's our job to be the eyes, the ears, the mouth, the heart and soul of the nation. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe Joanne would like to add to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah Joanne. Uh, I, I, I think the same way. For me, uh, poetry that has vitality is, you know, that's the mark of a good poem, it's vital. And I don't think you can get that, uh, that liveliness through trickery, just telling the truth. You know, if it's important to me, I can communicate that. If it's not important, why would I bother? <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and last question for to this: uh, What's because truth isn't pretty, 
what is the relationship between you as poets if you are if you come from these different roots and and backgrounds is poetry something like a bridge for you as poets only for you as poets not not only this you three but the canadian poets from all the country from all over the country Oh, well, it's I interesting. Think... It's an interesting question. I think uh, Canadian poetry is still quite regional, uh, so uh, so it's it's tricky in that way. But uh, go ahead, Gary. What were you thinking? Well, I think that there's a connection with the indigenous communities across this land in terms of poets. Mm -hmm. We all know each other because we're we're a small community. Mm -hmm. But we make major impacts across the country as well, too, in terms of the Canadian scene. In the last couple of years, um, it's been First Nations and Métis authors mm -hmm. that have really, really made a strong statement about Canada through their writing and have won the major, some of the major awards in Canada, the Governor General's Awards, and it, the list goes on and on and on. And so I think now in Canada, uh, First Nations, Métis, Inuit writers are taking a very strong um, stand in terms of the mm -hmm. content and their expression across the land. Mm -hmm. um, as Indigenous people, because there's still a small group of us you know, like I've known Joanne for many, many, many years. And, you know, um, I remember listening to her poetry, you know, 20, 30 years ago and just spellbound by her voice. You know, the bravery that, um, uh, and, 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 it was, and it was indigenous women that led the way in terms of writing. They, it, was, it was people like, like Joanne, like Jeanette Armstrong, Lee Miracle, we can go on and on and on with the list of women that broke open the ground for voices mm -hmm. like me to be heard and, and, the, and other people as well too uh, across this land. So we have that community and I, I, I'm very happy to say that in the last couple of years, indigenous writers across this land are being heard and that whereas we were not taken seriously before you know and uh, now we're taken very seriously so. you are you are a new wave of poetry in this country and I, I i find it very difficult to join in this dialogue this conversation as as a settler as a as a, as a colonial settler, I am a third generation immigrant and very much feel like an immigrant in this, in this country. Um, not because of my lack of European roots, because that's exactly what I do have, but because I was never really a part of the French or English dominant class, especially when I was growing up in Montreal. I always felt a part that's not to justify or, or, or make an attempt at, at, at making my experience equal to yours, but I sympathize and I empathize with that kind of, that, that kind of negative diaspora that's been created for our First Nations people here in Canada. But I can only be on the outside looking into that experience that, uh, that you have had and that you are still going through. Um, I know that as settlers, we now begin many of our poetry readings, even hockey games, by claiming to acknowledge the unceded territory of our First Nations people. And between you and me, I really feel as if that is simply paying lip service, that it really is kind of excusing ourselves for being the bastards that we've been historically for the last four or 500 years in this country. Um, you know, we talk of genocide. Well, there has been a genocide in many ways and it, it might not be comparable to what the Germans experience, 
but it comes pretty darn near close, especially if you are a First Nations person, I think. And insofar as how that informs poetry, I think it's making poetry in the Canadian scene right now very exciting, full of energy, new forms, new ideas, new directions. And uh, I'm very happy that's, that's happening. Unfortunately, I can only appreciate it. I can't really participate in it as a writer. And that in some ways for me is disappointing. You know, I mean, I, 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 I can't claim to have any kind of First Nations experience, though I, 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 I lived in a place called Long Lac, Ontario, where we were flanked by two reserves, an Ojibwe and a Cree reserve. And many of my friends were from those reserves. And we, we worked, we played, we lived together. We did a lot of drinking together as well. And it all came down to, you know, just, just being as human as we could be with each other. But I did feel the, the discrimination and the alienation that was brought upon them by a lot of other people. They were always second, if not third class citizens. Well, here's the thing. I disagree with you in one sense. I do believe that you can be a part of us by speaking with us and walking with us. The difference between yep. me and you, the difference between me and you in terms of our skin is that as a First Nations person in this country, I was never believable. Mm. Mm. But to walk in partnership, then we're believable as partners. So I think if, if all of our colleagues, all other poets across this land stood together on all common issues about the human conditions and humanity, and, and specifically in regards to the Métis, Inuit, and First Nations across this land, all kinds of changes would take place. If I said that I couldn't be a part of your community, then I'm segregating myself from you. And, and I'm already segregated because I live on a reserve, but, I write because there is an opportunity to speak the truth and to do it in a creative way where it's non-threatening. Mm. And, and poetry and is, is a, a non-threatening way to be able to reach others and build partnerships and relationships. So if you think yeah. about it from that perspective, Yes, we can make a difference together. But if we say, I can't do it because I, I, I just explained my limitations, well, then it's going to perpetuate. So but that, but that experience is, is yours, is your experience, Gary. It's, 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 and yours, Joanne, it's uniquely yours. And I, I will be accused of assimilation if I try to walk in your moccasins, you know, if I try to walk in your shoes. But that's not what I'm asking of you. What I'm right. asking of you is to say, hey, let's let's speak together as as friends. I'm not I'm not trying to be a white man. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not asking any, anybody to be native. You know? Okay. Well, yeah. that sounded like very good concluding remarks, walking in partnership and speaking together from both sides, many sides, also across the Atlantic. I also would say. in different languages. Also in different languages. Um, if it's all right with you, we'll just simply, Victor, okay? We'll call it a day. Call it a day. Conclude the session here. We're uh, just getting warmed up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we could go on, of course, yes. Um, Vielen Dank nochmal an alle, die teilgenommen haben. Many, many thanks. Victor, <laughs> du musst das Schlusswort sprechen. Thank you very much for your words, for your attention and for the band of poetry which unites us. Thank you very much for your statements. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Have a nice day. And here in Europe, a nice evening.
Right. Okay. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Okay. And Bye. I Thank hope you. I hope we will hear each other again. Okay. <laughs> Thank you.